overcoming giants. And I will tell you that God was even speaking to me yet, even this morning, uh, just 10, 15 minutes before we came on about different aspects of teaching this morning. This is so important. This is huge. In fact, uh, this is a rhema word for those who God is going to use. There's a remnant uh, of believers that God is going to use during this end time. Uh, and we are in, the, and I know I've been hearing this since my grandmother was alive and I was a little boy, but uh, I can definitely see it uh, more prevalently now today that Jesus is due back here at any moment. And the church has great work to do. We have great work to do. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your loving kindness, Lord God. And we thank you on this morning for giving us freedom. Father God, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for us. And Lord, we thank you for shedding your blood. You didn't have to do it, Lord. Father, because you gave your only begotten son, Lord, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but we should have everlasting life. It is a free gift if we would just accept it, Lord God, but it comes with great responsibility. And that's why you tell us, Lord God, that we should take up our, we should deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow you. So Father God, we commit to following you this morning. We commit to taking up our cross. We commit to denying ourselves, Lord God. And we say, teach us this morning and not I. Use me today as a spoon or a fork to bring food to the body that we might grow thereby, Lord God. With Lord God, we decrease and pray that you would increase, Lord God. We're excited about what it is that you're doing in this season, Lord God. Father God, we, we know that you bless faithfulness, Lord God. And so you said if you were faithful or a few things, Lord, that you would make us ruler over many, Lord God. And we thank you for the grace and mercy, Lord God, that you've bestowed upon us. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord, that we have to come together. There is no distance in spirit. So speak, Lord, and to each and every household, Lord God. Build up, Lord God, and encourage, Lord God. Correct and reprove, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. We bless you this morning. We're excited this morning and expected. It is in the mighty name of Jesus that we seal this prayer. And all of God's people say, amen, amen, and amen. Overcoming giants overcoming giants, not for the faint at heart, not for timid Christianity. God empowers us to not be timid Christians, but to be warriors in Christ. God is calling us out, calling us out of our own human frailties, because guess what? When God uses you, it's not used that's doing it anyway. It amazes me how many times people shrink back from doing things for Christ because of their looking in the mirror at their own natural capabilities and ability. Got nothing to do with that. And the moment you begin to focus on you is the moment you begin to sink into defeat. The moment you begin to focus within on the Christ on the inside of you is the moment that you become victorious. Oh, it's a matter of reflection. It's a matter of how you view in this thing. I can do all things through who? Not through your name. The Bible says I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Not, not your own natural ability, not your own gifts, not your own talents, but through Christ. But let's look at the scripture this morning because this is so important. First Samuel chapter 17, first Samuel chapter 17 familiar text, but definitely going to be looked at at a very different light this morning. First Samuel 17, there is a challenge by a giant by the name of Goliath of the Philistines, and there is men of Israel who all hear the challenge and are all afraid. I'm speeding you up to this moment where we're going to dive right in the scripture and where the scene picks up. And so, David is left behind because David is yet a boy. And of course, David's father sends David with food and, and drink to the battle because his brothers are all out there supposedly facing the giants, right? Facing the giant or facing in battle, in war. And so they send David to the front lines, if you, if you will, 
with food. And this is where the story picks up. Now, David has no idea up until this moment as to what's really going on, but we'll see what happens when he does. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion of the Philistine as who talked with them. This is David. So David's coming up to the front of the battle. Hey, I got some food. I got some supplies for you guys. You know, everything all right. You guys are okay. And it says, as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the word to the same words. And David heard them. What are the same words? I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase it. Goliath was calling Israel out. Uh, if he were talking today, you chumps, y'all ain't got nobody in y'all camp that can whoop me. I'll whoop all of y'all. Line it up. Let's square off. Y'all cowards, y'all soft, y'all weak, y'all God is dead. All of this stuff, Goliath is selling out the children of Israel and their God. So he repeats the words. In David's presence, although David was in place not for war, David was, David was in place to supply the people who were supposed to be fighting the battle. One of the things you have to realize is that David heard what everybody else heard, but you'll see that he responded differently. You, you can't allow a David to hear or see about the enemy parading himself or parading itself and we don't get upset. I'm talking about people that have this type of backbone. There's a spiritual backbone that 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 pervades in those who have this type of spirit, this type of tenacity. I, and again, I, I'm not pointing to the man. I'm talking about what God will do in a person. Amen. Verse 24. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him and were so afraid. They were afraid. These, these are grown men. These are men probably twice David's age, probably twice his size and stature. These are supposed to be warriors, right? But they ran. And the men of Israel sa said, have ye seen this man that has come up surely to defy Israel? He has come up and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the man, to the, excuse me, to the men that stood by him saying, what shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? and taketh away the reproach from Israel. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David did not like what was being said. There was something different. See, when, some, when the same issue falls on another set of ears, when the same issue is witnessed by a warrior in Christ, when the same same issue is presented before someone full of, full of the Holy Ghost, the response is different. So today, people are running from and dodging issues in fear of rejection. That's what's happening today. There, there are giants of cancel culture. If you, if you say certain things, if, if you talk on certain things, there are consequences. But David is also noted as being a man after God's own heart. So this is God's heart. And I talked to you in weeks past about how the Holy Spirit, when Paul ran up on Athens and saw the wickedness, he was grieved the way that God would be grieved because him and God's heart are knit together. We are one. That's what Jesus prayed before he left. He said, I pray that when this Holy Spirit come, that they will be one as we are one in you, Father. I pray that same oneness. And if there's that same oneness, then what upsets one will upset the other because we are both intertwined. We're, we're joint at the heart. I ain't going to even say at the hip, at the heart. He's saying, 
that he should defy the armies of the living God. David is upset. But being upset is one thing, right? Actually doing something about it is another. I, I, I know plenty of people that get upset about something and never pick up a sword. I, I know plenty of people that get mad about something, but never say, I'm going to tackle that issue. I know plenty of people that grind their teeth and get really mad and fuming and all of this stuff and just don't do nothing but talk. You ever see that, that, that meme where they got the two dogs and they both barking at each other and there's nothing but a fence separating them. And then the owner opens up the fence and both dogs kind of close the fence back up. <laughs> Open the fence up. They God is saying the fence is open on all of these issues. Notice what it says in verse 28. This is very key. So let's backtrack. Here's David. David's the youngest. David's very young. David is yet a boy. All of these men hear the same issue. They run, they terror, they're, they're afraid. And David is upset. But watch this. Watch the words of Eliab in verse 28. This is his oldest brother, his eldest brother. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. He overheard David speaking unto the men. He overheard this conversation. Notice what it says. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why camest thou down hither? And with whom has thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and thy naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. <laughs> Whole lot going on here. In fact, it is the entitled, it, it is part of the entire meat of the word of God today. This, this attitude. One of the barriers to challenging or overcoming giants is overcoming the religious people that protect them. Oh, I'll say that again. One of the barriers and challenges in overcoming giants is first overcoming the religious carnal people that stand in the way of them. Here is Eliab, the oldest brother, David's oldest brother, representing religious people, people who have stuck, who are stuck in religion. They've been doing it this way for 25, 30, 40 years. They, they're stuck. They got a methodology of how they do church and how they do things and how they tackle issues. And no, we don't bring up politics in church. And no, we don't talk about sex or homosexuality. We don't do those things. And, and when things when, when things are running rampant in the news media cycle, we, we don't touch those. And we won't use social media. And, and no, we won't go out in the community. We, we, we're not going to do any of those things because those things are not the church's job. Eliab's eldest brother, when he heard, when he heard, Eliab's brother heard when he spake with the men and he was angry. It says his anger was kindled against David. Why? I'm going to tell you why. This is what happens sometimes. People get angry when you're willing to tackle issues that they've sat down on because you're making them look bad. Oh, <laughs> you make religious people look bad when they had a church on the corner for 55 years and nobody thought to go outside that same church and feed the homeless people down the block. You make people upset and angry with you when you decide to go into prisons when they've been in ministry for 58 years and never thought to step foot outside of them same pews. You make people angry 
when you said we're going to set up a tent on this on 25th and 3rd and we go do some real evangelism evangelism is not just putting up a sign up outside and inviting people up the church you can put all the little cute words you want to put up on your bulletin board you can put all the little nice signs you can hand out all the pamphlets you want to that's not evangelism baby mm -mm. so when you say that Religious people will always shoot down your ideas. Religious people will always try to make you feel strange. You're weird for wanting to do that. You're strange for wanting to do that. Well, we don't have to do all of that. We're, we're fulfilling the call. No, this isn't the rest. See, there's no such thing as outreach ministry. There's no such thing as, well, this is for the, no, no, no. Everybody is called to outreach. But people in their religiosity, the same way Eliab, because he'd been doing it longer. No, 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 no. You two wet behind the ear. Didn't you start serving the Lord last week? Didn't you start serving him last year? Guess what? In the spirit realm, when you're born again, Holy Spirit can give you wisdom beyond the years of someone spending it. I'm not, I'm not saying that we should automatically put people in certain positions. Yeah, there are certain things we should put a, no, a, a novice in where, where they have to grow up in the Lord. But I'm talking about serving. Serving is something that can be done immediately. Going out is something that can be done immediately. How do you gain the experience unless you get your hands dirty? It's, it's not enough for us to sit around and, and, and get into this word of God, but then not exercise it out in the community, not exercise it out in the, out in the mission field. Jesus, when he was teaching his disciples, they were out doing. And as they were out doing, Jesus was bringing up teaching moments. Jesus was saying, now you see what happened over here with this person? When, when they was trying to cast out the demon and they couldn't cast him out, they came back to Jesus and said, why couldn't we cast him out? Guess what? If they don't get out of the church, if they don't leave the synagogue, they'll never run into the demon possessed. May, they might in the church because that's, that's going on too. My point being is religious people will get angry and upset when you see the same issues, when you see the same problems and you speak about doing something about it. Carnal people. What they, that's what Paul said. I cannot speak unto you as under spiritual, but as under carnal. Where there's envy and strife, are ye yet carnal, meaning worldly. And notice when, when see, this is the point here. Well, if you, you don't have to go there right now, but if you go back and you look at 1 Corinthians 3, I've talked about this before. When you look at what Paul uses as a litmus test for what carnalism is, he does not speak to knowledge. He does not say, well, you're carnal because you don't, you can't quote 50 scriptures. No, doesn't say you're carnal because he said, you're not, you're carnal because you don't understand the Hebrew and the Greek. And the, no, 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 no. He doesn't point to any of that. He points to character. He says, where is there's amongst you envying and strife? So carnality is not about head knowledge. Carnality is about a person's inability to put what they've read in the Bible into action. You can have Bible notes uh, 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 as, as large as a room full of the, uh, a Bible study, I mean, or excuse me, a, a, a law office. But if you're not living it, you're still carnal. Carnality can only be examined through the lens of your character. Then he's concerned about Eliab. He says he's angry, right? And he says, why did you even come down here? Why are you even here? They will even question you like you got ul ulterior motive. Why are you even here? Why, why are you even coming down? Why are you even fellowshipping? Why are you even over here? And then he says, with whom have you left your sheep in the wilderness? Don't you got something else to attend to? Don't you got other business? Then he accuses David of wanting to do it out of pride. No, I'm just tired of the problems. 
I, I just got the heart of God to where it ain't about pride. It ain't about me getting the credit. I, I'm going to give the glory to God. I'm just tired of seeing this going on. I can't drive down Nebraska and look at homeless people and say, let's not do something about I, I, I can't drive. I can't know that there are people in prison. And Jesus told me that when I was sick and when I was in prison, you came to visit me. I just can't hear that stuff going on and not do nothing about it. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm built different. The Holy Spirit did something different on the inside of me. I just can't allow that stuff to happen. I can't allow myself to see these enemies. I'm not just going to shut my mouth when I see little boys trying to be stuffed in little girls' bathroom. I'm just not going to shut my mouth when I see stuff going on in politics that they say separation of church and state. The devil is a lie. I'm just not going to shut my mouth on social media. Everything is my daddy's. The providence is all over the earth. So I'm going to open my mouth on Instagram. I'm going to open my mouth on YouTube, Rumble, Church House, outside of the church house, and we're going to go about tackling these issues. But see, you got to allow. Jesus says, blessed are you when you are persecuted. That's what persecution is. Cancel culture. Blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness sake. You're doing it for the Lord. So let them call you everything but a child of God. Let them unfriend you. Let them not invite you to the birthday party. Do all of those things because it's going to happen. Got family. I got family right now. I'm with her. I say I'm not. I'm talking about Kamala Harris. I'm, I'm with her. I'm not. I'm not. I'm with the principles and the issues as it pertains to God's word. I can't stand behind somebody that's willing to murder innocent children. That's what it is. It's not care. They call it care, but it's murder. I, I can't see these are the things that people don't want to talk about today. The Iliabs would say, Pastor Branham, don't, don't talk about that. I've had people, when I was standing up in front of folk, Pastor, you should be talking about that. The devil is a lie. And I told them, <laughs> in the love of God, if this bothers you and you can't sit there and listen, then there's the door, baby. I'm, I'm not going to compromise for Christ. I'm not going to compromise God's word. Verse 29, and David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? He's saying, listen, this, this, this passion that you see, there's a cause. There's a cause. You know, that's what the definition of nonprofit is when you find a cause, when you find something that is greater than yourself. Uh, we're, we, we, we're the, we have the cause of Christ. It's beyond a 501c3. It's a beyond a nonprofit. It's our calling in life. The cause is the cause of Christ. People will always get, up, get upset when you point out enemies that they've allowed to run rampant. When you have God's heart, you can see the same enemy and passion to expose, confront, and defeat. And your passion to expose, confront, and defeat takes over. Look at Ephesians. We're going we're gonna to come back to this text, but I want you to look at Ephesians because I want us to be empowered, right? The word of God is what empowers us. What do I mean by that? The word of God is where we derive our authority. I get so many times, what is your opinion on this? And what is your opinion on that? And why are you pointing out this? And you're not supposed to be judging. You're not supposed to be saying anything about anything. You're just supposed to shut your mouth and pray. Well, I, you know, I really want to say, well, thank you, Eliab. Because you have Eliabs out there who are in the church that will say, well, you're not supposed to say anything about these issues, Pastor. You're not supposed to be talking about these. You're not supposed to be putting stuff out there like that on social media. You're not supposed to be blasting stuff. No, you're not supposed to be, no, you're just supposed to shut your mouth and pray. But that's Eliab. That, that's, that's that old regime. That's, that's some old religious folk. All we do, we get, we hear the whole my mule while I shout missionary Baptist church. We've been here 95 years. 
Mm-hmm. And we don't set our foots outside of this church for nothing. We just have our little bake sales and bless the Lord. Sister Owen, she makes her great cake every year. We have the pastor appreciation, but no, we don't go out there in that world. Mm-mm, the homeless people know. No, 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 no. Devil is a lie. Dead. We ain't going out there to no prisons because them some dangerous folk out there. No, we just pray for them, but we ain't going inside. No. Ephesians 5.11 in the NIV. Ephesians 11. Y'all know I'm silly. Ephesians 5.11 in the NIV. This is your power right here, right? Notice what it says. This is your charge. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. That's sin. That's the world. That's evil. That's LGBTQ. That's and, and the rest of the alphabet, that, 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 that's the, 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 all of those different evils out there, abortions and all of these different things. We're the call. It says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. You mean to tell me, Pastor Jay, it's my job to expose? Who else got the light? The Bible says that we're the light of the world. How else can something get exposed except the light expose it? You are the light. Jesus said what light is supposed to be put on the bushel? No, light's supposed to be put on a hill. Why is it supposed to be put on a hill? So it can expose. How do people understand what sin is and how to turn from it if it's not exposed for what it is? The devil has carefully crafted lies and given people a license to stay in lifestyles, to stay in a certain way, to not go into certain places, all behind a lie. We are the light of the world. We're supposed to say, no, brother, no, sister, no, this is not that way. No, this is sin. You need to turn. Jesus Christ died. We have the good news. Eliab was embarrassed that his fear was being exposed. That's why he got upset with David. When we are willing to confront what others shy away from in timidity, we will get attacked. There's no such thing as mind your business as a watchman. Ezekiel 3, 33, 6 says that we're watchmen. What does a watchman do? A watchman is like the person at security, the person that's on guard, the person that is the protector. We are God's light in the earth. Can you imagine if Jesus came here and never told anybody who he was, never told anybody that if they didn't accept him, that they were they were going to go to hell? Can you imagine that? He just walked around, do, 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 do. It don't matter to me. I, I'm going back to be with the father anyway. So uh, you can go to hell in a handbasket. It don't matter to me. With gasoline jeans on. That would be cruel. But he didn't. For God so loved the world. Not just loved the world, he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. If we just believe it in him, we have everlasting life. So let me go back with an example. Back in 2020, this is fairly recent. I saw this, this spirit run rampant inside of the church. But it was also a year of exposure. Amazing how 2020 is what they tell you if the eye doctor is perfect eyesight. And this happened in 2020. And we got a perfect revelation. Some things we would not have seen had it not been for 2020. In 2020, COVID exposed a lot of unbelievers, carnal Christian and religious Christians. And I'm saying this because one of the things that the Bible tells us to do is examine ourselves. Sometimes the only time people get to examine themselves is when they go through a trial or tri tribulation. 
So this this is not a throwaway, like we throw these people away because I have friends who are pastors. I have friends in my family. I have brothers and sisters in Christ who failed this test, but I have to point out the test that was given. I had pastors who had been pastoring for several years before I was uh, before I ever thought about being a pastor. They they Iliabs. I had some Iliabs calling my phone and texting me because they heard that I was still going out in the community and feeding the homeless and ministering. Do you know those people tried to rebuke me for doing that? Do you know those people even tried to condemn me for doing that? said that I was putting people at danger, said that I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. I'm talking about people that's got like four, 500 people in their church. I'm talking about pastors who we've been to, we, we fellowship with them, we've hung out, and I know these guys, and it's just like, and I thought I, I thought I knew that they believed what the Bible said. But when the giant called COVID showed up on the scene, there are some people that shut up their churches and ran in the opposite direction. When the giant that was not named Goliath, but COVID showed up, everybody all of a sudden threw what they knew out of the window. This big bad giant named COVID. And to us who are Davids, who are still out saying this is just an ordinary day, I'm still going to go out to the park and I'm still going to give sandwiches and waters and I'm still going to give out supplies and I'm still, if the prison would allow me, I'll go inside of a prison. I'm still going to go into these places. I'm still going to fellowship and hang out with brothers and sisters in Christ. But let me show you from the word of God. Because see, you got to be armed with the word of God when giants show up. Because like I said, one of the first barriers to the giant is not the giant itself. He had the first get past Eliab. You would have thought that Eliab with his knees shaking and everything would have just said, go on ahead, David, go on out there and fight that battle because I'm too afraid. No, I'm going to stand in your way. I'm going to criticize and ridicule you for even wanting to go out there and stand in the face of that giant called COVID. Psalms 91. And they got monkey pox, M pox out there now. They getting ready to try to ramp up and try to scare some folk. Psalms 91, verse 5. This is what the word of God says to us as it pertains to anything and everything. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. That's you, believer. That's us nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. That's pestilence, that's sickness, that's disease, that's danger, that's anything. Notice what it says in verse seven, a thousand shall fall at thy side. If you see somebody drop dead on the side of you and 10,000 at my right hand, but it shall not come near me. My God. <clears throat> Again, this type of boldness, is not a this this is not something that is uh, uh, intrinsic to man. This is not something that is natural. <clears throat> you don't get this on your own, right? But we are to have it with us. Look at what it says in Matthew eight, and these are the same scriptures, by the way that I happen to share with these brothers and sisters in Christ, these, these pastors, these Iliabs. I, I refer to them as Iliab because they had that religious mindset. Matthew 8, and I even made a long video. I, I made a long post on, on Facebook during this time too. I, I addressed them. I said, I can't talk to everybody that's, you know, that's, that's got these mindsets all at one time. I would, I put them on a Zoom if I could. But some, I didn't get a chance to just, could talk to, but I, because I know they follow my page, I did a post and I use these same exact scriptures. Matthew chapter eight, verse one, when he was come down from the mountain, this is Jesus, great multitudes followed him and behold, there came a leper and worshiped him saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him saying, I will be clean. 
and immediately his leprosy was cleansed. This is what Jesus did. Now, I want us to understand leprosy and COVID is so, so closely <clears throat> related in that leprosy, according to the law, you can go back and you can look up leprosy. That's, you know, a little study. If you want to go look up the law as it pertains to leprosy, was a deadly disease that if you had it, you were supposed to distance yourself. You were supposed to social distance. You were supposed to burn stuff if you if you touched it or whatnot. And then if someone came in contact with you that had it, they definitely were not supposed to touch you. They're supposed to announce unclean, unclean. So here's, here's Jesus breaking all of these protocol. Jesus, when he came into contact with the man with leprosy, he touched him and healed him. And Jesus said, verse four, unto him, see that thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. <clears throat> Lepers were supposed to social distance, live outside the camp, that's isolate. That's what they told people during COVID. And if the person came into contact with the affected person, they're supposed to do the same thing, follow, follow the same rules to themselves. Jesus broke all of that protocol. And if you go to Matthew chapter 10, you don't have to do it right now. He gives his disciples the charge to do the same exact thing. He tells his disciples to go and heal lepers. How do you think they're going to heal? The way that they saw their teacher heal by laying hands on. This was an example. And so I had these people ringing my phone, texting me, sending me personal me messenger, all of this. Oh, Pastor, what you doing? You crazy. What are you doing out there? It's 2020, 2021. People dying. They're killing people out there. And I said to them in love, I said, well, if my Bible says a thousand may fall at my side and 10,000 at my right hand, but it shall not come near me. At what point am I supposed to not believe that? The Bible says in Matthew 28, and it says at the end of the chapter, and you shall, if you, if you pick up any deadly thing, if I pick up any, pick up any deadly thing also means if I happen to pick up any germs or disease, if I pick up any deadly thing, it shall not harm me. Do I really believe that? See, everybody don't believe what the Bible says. You have people that can quote scripture. You have people that, that know the word of God, but just like when Goliath showed up to the battlefield, all of these mighty men of valor, all these mighty men of war, when the giant showed up, everybody, the giant exposed what people actually believed. The giant exposed how they really thought. It's one thing to say that I trust God. It's another thing to act like it. I, I, I'm just saying, trust is not words. Trust is an action. I trust that this chair is going that this chair is going to hold me. Okay, sit down in it. Well, I, I ain't going. You know, I ain't going to actually sit in it, pal. I, you know, I I said that I believe the chair going to hold me. I ain't going to actually sit in it. No, because you don't believe that the chair is going to hold you. Stop lying to people. See, this is the self-examination of self. We got giants that we're going to be facing. And you need to recognize that there are going to be Iliabs in your life. Iliab, that elder brother, that person that's been serving the Lord for 25, 30 plus years, just because they've been serving longer don't mean that they know better. <laughs> oh, just because they've been serving longer and got 15 titles and got 12 of uh, awards on the wall does not mean that they know better. This is the misconception. There are people who are following behind religious people, people who are because of mama and granddaddy and auntie and cousin and every, you know, this church been in the, in, in the city, in my town for 150 years and my great, 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 great grandmother. And this is the way that they do it. Be careful that you do not allow man's indoctrination to imprison you to a false dead gospel. Had some churches say, man, if you ain't got no vaccine, you can't come up in here. 
I said, my vaccine is the blood of Jesus. How about that? The blood ain't good no more. <laughs> I, I need to put something in my body. The blood ain't good no. The blood shall never lose its power. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm talking about some people who get behind a pulpit and they just trust God. And if you won't hold on to His unchanging hand, they go COVID. Up, oh, time to go. Acts chapter nine. Verse 11, Acts chapter nine, verse 11. I'm saying this because some of us have had Eliab's in our life. And I'm talking about Eliab's as that religious person. The worst person you can talk to when you're going through and having to face a giant or giants is somebody that's religious. Somebody that does not have the power of God operating on the inside of them. They'll talk you out of being in faith. They'll make you more fearful or scared about the situation or the circumstance of the person than you originally were. You don't need to associate sometimes with those type of people. If I had to listen to those pastors, if I had a gave ear to any of those people who was texting me and sending me messages, if I had a gave ear to any of that, I would have missed out on operating in demonstration according to the word of God. <coughs> Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verse 11. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go to his street, called, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarshish. For behold, he prayeth, and he seeth in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand upon him, that he might receive sight. This is Ananias. He's a man of God. Saul, who was persecuting and killing Christians, was now just newly converted. He was on the road to Damascus. You can read up in the early in the chapter. Jesus appeared to him. He gets this conversion. He's now saved. And God says, I'm sending you, Ananias, to lay hands on him that he might receive sight. He is blinded. Then Ananias answered and said, Lord, I have heard many of this man, how much evil he have done to the saints and to Jerusalem. And here he have authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said, go thy way, for he is my chosen vessel to bear my name before the Gentiles and to the kings, the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Ananias is apprehensive. Ananias is like, wait, 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 wait a second. What, you know, God, um, I've heard many things of this man. So God, so here's the thing. And this is, this is happening today. Lord, I, I heard what you said that when you were sick and when you were in prison, they came to visit you. So how is it that I can visit a sick person if the sick person has COVID, but man tells me the social distance? How is it that I'm supposed to lay hands on folk? The Bible tells me lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, except in this instance. See, you're going to have some times where the word of God and what man is telling you contradicts. You're going to have some times where what God is telling you and what you can see and hear is contradictory. Ananias, like you and I sometimes, but we got to break out of this. And this is the reason why a lot of people don't go into prisons and jail ministries. It's because of this same thing. They're fearful. What Ananias is saying is, God, I heard about Saul's record. Saul got a record. I looked Saul up online. It's got carjacking, murder, robbery, rape, all of this. Stuff. I, I, I ain't going in there and talk to no, mm -mm, I ain't going in there. I hear what you said, Lord. But these people got a record. Everybody got a record at the foot of the cross. If God was to put everybody's sin on a monitor, wouldn't nobody be able to stand? Everybody sit there behind down somewhere, including the bishop in the pulpit. Oh, you go stand up like you righteous on your own. Oh, I'm just going to one finger out the door. 
So the equalizer is the fact that we all have sin and the equalizer on the inside of us who are born again is that we have the power of the Holy Ghost. And Ananias is saying, hold up. You want me to go to this man who I know got the history of locking folk like me up, of beating people like me up, of killing people like me? He's got a record. Jesus reiterates, go for he is my chosen vessel. We don't know who God's chosen vessel is. And see, I pose this question when I go into churches and I'm, I'm recruiting it for volunteers to go into the prison. I said, it's amazing how we can say and we can quote scripture and we can talk about how God, he changed the soul of the Bible and it changed them in us and he changed them in the Paul. And you know, they could do all that stuff. Y'all know I'm silly. But then Joe, who's on the corner slinging drugs and walk with a pistol every day. God say, now nah, I need you to go witness to him. Uh -uh. I know you powerful, God, but huh, mm, Joe got, huh, huh, he got a pass. I want you to invite that sister that you know go. She works at a strip club. I, I want you to invite her. to. Ah, huh, I don't think she ready yet, Lord. She's my chosen vessel. Iliabs will talk you out of ministry is what I'm saying. Iliabs will talk you out of doing what it is that God would have you to do. Notice I said, God, you got to be led by the spirit. A word in season, how good is it? The word in season means that the person's heart is ready for it. See, when the Bible talks about sowing the seed, sometimes, sometimes God has a season in which the ground is more fertile for us to sow seeds of the word of God. Sometimes people have to be going through in order for them to see God. Sometimes people have to be brought down so low in order for them to look up. As long as they're riding high, as long as they got money in the bank, as long as everything going good in life, they ain't trying to think about or talk about God. But a moment something happens, God says, now that's the season that I want you to sow. I want you to sow some fertile seed. I want you to sow some seed in that fertile ground. It's fertile right now, but you got to be sensitive to the spirit and you don't have to, and you got to keep them Iliads about your life. But it's impossible sometimes to not allow others to hear or see what it is that you're doing. Just be ready for the persecution. Just be ready for them to talk about you. Just be ready for them to walk away. Just be ready for them to disassociate themselves with you. That's okay. Look at what it says in Galatians 4 and 16 in the Amplified. This is so true. Galatians 4, 16, in the Amplified, this happens more often than I think any, uh, I ain't going to say any other scripture. I'll just say that this happens a whole lot in the body of Christ as being a bearer of the truth. So have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? You have so many people that will make you their enemy because you simply told them the truth. Paul says, I, I become your enemy because I tell you the truth. People don't want you to point out deficiencies. All they want you to do is walk around with a pair of pom-poms and cheer for them all day. That's warped. That's demonic. Because you never get better. I can't be your pom-pom cheerleader when the Bible tells me that I'm supposed to reprove and correct. Yes, it does tell me to exhort. It does tell me to encourage. But the Bible doesn't tell me to put on a put on a, a cheerleader skirt and walk around with pom poms and cheer you on every day and never point out anything. That's demonic. And if you're asking people to do that, we need to examine ourselves. Why we don't want to get confronted with the truth? That's immaturity. I have to do the same thing. If I if if I'm if I'm constantly not wanting to hear something. And I'm constantly just wanting to hear good, 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 and nothing to correct me, nothing to cause me to grow. We can't grow like that. It's the same thing in the in the pulpit. I've heard I've heard some people, you know, people love the the. Uh, I, I'm, I am gonna pick on them because it's 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 it's, it's, it's obvious what's going on. Joel Osteen. 
well, I don't want to say that anybody's going to hell. You know, I just, I don't want to warn anybody. It's not me. You know, I, if, you know, I, I can't say that, you know, a Muslim is not, you know, uh, I just, God is so big and I just, you know, I just want to love, you know, and I, no. You can love people to death. Yeah. Another type of love people to death, which is a fake false love. Sometimes I need to put my pull, pull pom-poms down and put on my drill sergeant hat and get my whistle and tell you we in war. Tell you that we're in war. If I don't put my pom-poms down and put my whistle on and my coaching hat on and my, and my, and my drill sergeant hat on, when we go to war and you get shot in the head on the first round of fire, that's on me as a Christian. When I went to basic training, they were not playing with us. They let us know. They let us know. This is what you're up against. This is the inherent danger that you're facing. Giants are out there. The Iliads of the day don't want you confronting LGBTQ and the rest of the alphabet from the pulpit. They don't, they don't want you discussing politics. They don't want you discussing current events or social issues. But what good is a first responder without updates on where the sick and the hurting are? There are false prophets out there that will lie to you. Dr. Feelgood. First Samuel. First Samuel. First Samuel 31. First Samuel 31. First Samuel 31. First Samuel 17, 31, excuse me. First Samuel 17, 31. Still picking up in the scripture. So let's go back. David, he's not brought out to war. His oldest brothers are. His dad sends him to the battlefield. Go bring your brother some food. When he goes to bring his brother some food, he overhears Goliath make the same call out again to the men of Israel. The men of Israel all run in terror. They're all afraid. David is ready to challenge Goliath, but the very first person who tries to confront him and stop him is another brother, Eliab. Basically telling he's, he's embarrassed and he's angry that David is allowed to see the same enemy that he's allowed to run rampant and David is ready to confront He's, a, he's angry at David because David is embarrassing him by saying, no, these issues shouldn't be. These situations shouldn't be. I'm not going to stand for it anymore. In verse 31, David is ready to go. It's one thing to hear about something. It's one thing to see it, but it's another thing to say, now put me in the ring, coach. 31. And when David's and when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, "Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine." <laughs> you got doers of the word, and you got hearers only. David is a doer. I'm not just going to hear about this situation. I'm not just going to hear about this enemy. I'm just not going to allow me to, I'm just not going to allow it to see it. I'm going to do something about it. I will go and fight this Philistine. What giant are you going to fight today? What giants are the church going to fight today? There are giants out there beating their chest. In invading our children's schools. There are giants out there invading our neighborhoods, invading culture. What giants are we going to say no more? 
People would say, well, that's too big. Entertainment is too big. Music is too big. Music, no, 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 no. The gates of hell won't prevail against the church. How is revival going to take place if the church says it can't be done? Hmm. <clears throat> Verse 33. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight him, fight with him. For thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. The, the flesh will always mask the limitations, mask limitations in the natural. King Saul only sees what man can see. Some things seem to dwarf us in the natural, but spiritually. <clears throat> there are no match for God. Notice what David said <clears throat> in the preceding verses. And David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and, a, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be as one of them, seeing that, seeing he have defied the armies of God. David is not selling wolf tickets. David is running down his resume. You better peep my resume. David... As a boy, David said, I killed a lion and a bear. I grabbed this joker by the beard and slew him and delivered the sheep out of his mouth. I, in other, I've been fighting for the Lord a long time just because my name ain't ringing out there, just because I don't have a big name, just because I don't have a big this, a, a shining light, just because you don't recognize me doesn't mean that I ain't been working for the Lord, doesn't mean that I haven't been doing what I need to do for the Lord, just because you got social media posts and you got conferences and you got everybody showing up and doing all of these things doesn't mean that I don't got a track record of fighting for the Lord. Doesn't mean that I don't have a track record for overcoming giants. In fact, if I laid out my testimony right now, half of the room would be like, I would have gave up a long time ago. All of that stuff you went through, that's your resume to be able to fight the giant today. God has said, all you got to do is just look back. All you got to do is look back. All you got to do is look back. If I overcame this and, and I made it out of that and I was able to survive this, how much more this giant that I'm facing today, it's not going to overcome me. I'm going to overcome it. You got to have that type of backbone. Verse 37. David said, moreover, the Lord delivered me out of the paw of the lion and the, out of the paw of the bear. He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go and the Lord be with me. I love it what David does in this conclusion. He says, don't get it twisted. Everything that I made it up out of, every victory that I had, he says, the Lord delivered me. And the same Lord that delivered me out of this and the same Lord that delivered me out of that. And the same Lord that caused me to overcome this giant is going to cause me to overcome this one. Verse 38. And David girded up his sword upon his armor. Excuse me. And Saul armed David with his armor. And he and put a helmet of brass upon his head. And he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword with his armor and he essayed to go. For he proved not, he not, he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these for I have not proved them. And David put them, put them off him. <clears throat> this is very critical and crucial. 
There are some methods that are succinct with the word of God. You have fasting, you have prayer, you have the anointing oil, you have corporate prayer. You can touch and you, you can agree, you can iron, sharpen iron. <clears throat> but I want you to, I want you to understand this. And <clears throat> I'm not discounting the fact that sometimes God will speak through people, right? So I want you to take this word in balance, but this is very, very critical and very crucial. God can speak through people <clears throat> around you prophetically. God can use the mouth of anybody. But there's also times when you have an Eliab who's religious or you have a Saul who is well-meaning and trying to get you to fight the battle in the manner in which they would fight the battle. You have to get your battle plan directly from God because there are some methods that may have worked for others that will not work for you because God is saying, it's the method that I want you to choose in this battle. This is the way that I want you to fight. This is the way that I want you to do war. This is the way that I want you to fight the battle. So what you have to do is you have to pray and you have to ask and seek God. Now, that's not to get into pride and God give you a battle plan that is not in agreement with you. Naaman was told to dip in the Jordan seven times. It was the nasty Jordan River. Naaman, who was a prominent man, did not want to do that. And in the scripture, it says that I thought that the man of God, he says, I thought you just would have waved your hand over me and I would be healed. God was not going to do it that way. And so Naaman went away angry, but he had brothers in Christ who came to him and said, listen, if God had asked you to do something that you wanted to do that was favorable, that was not as embarrassing as you think this is, then you would have done it. But because he's asking you to go in the Jordan River, you don't want to do it. So they, act, they, they basically counseled with him and Naaman went to the Jordan River. There are some Jordan Rivers that God is calling us to that are not what we would do. That's not the port, that's not the plan that we would choose for our life. That's not the method that we would choose for our life. But we have to be willing to get our hands dirty. We have to be willing to look foolish. We have to be willing to look silly. We have to be willing to get a little dirty to receive the blessing of God. So sometimes what we got to do is we got to say to people, okay, I hear what you're saying, but this is the way that the Lord would have me to do it. Make sure that you're hearing from God. Because David, if he had a went out within the battle and fought Goliath in Saul's armor in the way that Saul would have had him to fight the battle, David would have lost. David had enough understanding. He had enough revelation from God. No, Saul, I appreciate the gesture. I appreciate the help. But this is how God would have me to do this thing. Got to be able to differentiate. Go down to verse 45. Go down to verse 45. This is David now going out and confronting Goliath. Then said unto David to the Philistine, thou comest to me with sword and with spear and with a shield. But I come to thee, watch this. He said, you coming to me with physical weapons. I don't care if the enemy tries to take you out with sickness. I don't care if the enemy tries to take you out with court cases or lawfare. I don't care if they got a resurrected Johnny Cochran, if that word, you know, I'm just naming somebody. I don't care if the person coming at you with physical intimidation. Notice what David says. He says, you're coming to me with physical weapons, with sword, with spear, with shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. He's saying, I don't need a whole lot of people around me. Clear out the room. 
All I need is the Lord. I don't need a whole lot of backing. I don't need a whole lot of people with five, three letter names. I don't need no PhDs, master degree. I don't need any of that. All I need is Jesus. Some of us overcomplicate things. God said the things that I'm going to deliver to you is not going to take a credit score. Some of us get caught up in all of these worldly things. David is saying, you come into me with sword and spear and shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord. Verse 48. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David. And David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. David was not playing games. What the enemy was causing people to run from, David was running to. <laughs> David put his hand in a bag and took the took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with the sling and with the stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Hallelujah. Verse 51. Therefore, David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his own sword. <laughs> and drew out of the sheep thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Why would David cut? Well, that was part of the spiritual and that's also symbolic. Some things you need to cut off and make sure they're dead. And the only way you make sure that they're dead is to cut off the head. You got to cut it off at the head in the name of Jesus. David slew Goliath without ever needing a sword. The Bible says that he had five smooth stones, five standing for the number of grace, the grace of God coming to him in his name. And he overcame the giant. Overcoming the giants. Jesus name.